Moltíssimes gràcies per la seva presència. Moltíssimes gràcies també a la Fundació Catalunya La Pedrera i Arcàdia, que contribueix tan directament a que aquestes converses siguin possibles. I desitjo, desitgem, que passin una bona estona. Senyor Gardiner, molt bones tardes. Créame, és un autèntic honor tenir-lo aquí entre nosaltres, un verdadero privilegi. I no només per als que estem en aquesta sala, sinó també per a la ciutat. Cada vegada que vostè ha dirigit a Barcelona, i d'això doi fe, ha estat acollit amb admiració i jo diria que amb un merecit fervor. És la resposta a una manera seva de fer impecable, a un mode profund de pensar la música. Un té la sensació que quan vostè dirig està tenint lloc just en aquest mateix instant un esdeveniment de la cultura. Cosa que rares vegades pot dir-se. Vostè sap que la mà de l'orfebre és cada vegada més escassa en un món, també en l'artístico, on l'especulació va guanyant terreny i prima l'oportunisme i la quantitat. Encara que el seu extraordinari llibre sobre Johann Sebastian Bach, la música en el Castillo del Cielo, va ser, per dir-ho d'algun mot, el eje d'aquest encuentro, me gustaría no desaprovechar la oportunidad y preguntarle muchas otras cosas y así procuraré que sea. Sin embargo, desearía empezar preguntándole, sobre todo para las personas que todavía no han leído su, su hermoso libro, que es todo un hito, ¿por qué considera que el núcleo de la música de Bach se encuentra en sus cantatas? Quizá por aquello que afirmaba Lutero de que cantar es rezar dos veces. Um, to me, the cantatas of Bach are, occupy a paradoxical position. On the one hand, they're what the Germans call Gebrauchsmusik. In other words, they're that music d'occasion. They're written, um, they're composed for a church service um, to be performed just before the sermon. Uh, and they're ephemeral by nature in, in the sense that they're composed for one specific Sunday in the liturgical year. And then you move on. And it, in a way, it's a bit like Charles Dickens writing his novels, that he wrote them in monthly installments, and then eventually it became a, um, a book. I mean, you know, uh, it's extraordinary that Dickens was able to, to write episodes and then they all formed a cycle um, in a book. And in a way, Bach is doing the same thing. He, he wrote episodes, or he wrote individual cantatas lasting 20 minutes to 30 minutes each. And they form an incredible cycle. And if you trace that cycle and you experience it, as, as, as I have done, um, in the course of a whole year, you, you experience a great musical brain um, and understanding how religion and how the pagan a secular year coincide, how they, how they interlock. And in the process, it seems to me that Bach sh shows quite a lot of his, not just his intellectual fiber and his, his uh, incredible brain power, but also reveals facets of his personality which you don't find in the other music so much. You, you understand how he struggled with certain issues. I mean, there he was at the back of the church in St. Thomas's in Leipzig, and he, his music rains down on the congregation like 
um, exosets, missiles. Um, and his targets are sometimes really quite uh, sharply delineated. I mean, hypocrites, he cannot stand. Um, time servers, people who pretend that they are Christians and are not Christians. People who don't pay attention. He is pitiless. He, he, he gets really cross and angry. On the other hand, at another extreme, you find that he is incredibly compassionate and tender towards those who are experiencing suffering, uh, uh, grieving, or those that have experienced um, a death in the family, and, and those who are, who are struggling with their belief, those who are finding it really a problem to reconcile, as I think many, many Germans uh, did in the 18th century, when you just, you've got this revival of Lutheranism overlapping and conflicting with Enlightenment rational thought. And that produces conflict and contradiction. So to me, in, even though they're episodic, they, they're pieces of a huge, they're like the individual jewels in a necklace. And the biggest jewel of all in the year is the passion. I've seen do that. And they are incredibly, I think maybe the fact that he, he wrote them at speed, very fast, means that he didn't have too much time to revise or to correct. He, again, a bit like Charles Dickens, he had to get it down on paper. And then he had to steer his, his group of, of young performers to produce a really important musical uh, performance. Um, and it can't have been easy because the conditions of work in the Thomas church in, in the school were not at all conducive to good performance. And often there was sickness amongst the boys. Often there was conflict with the headmaster who says the boys shouldn't be singing music, they should be studying Latin and geography and whatever. And there was conflict with the town council in Leipzig who didn't really approve of complex music and all those, these things. And yet Bach, he triumphs. And it's so admirable. So that's what makes me love him so much. Muchas gracias. Pero, ¿no cree usted que por la concepción de Bach, por su mente tan yeah. poliédrica, okay. eh, con estructuras que, que, como diría Spinoza, se, se pueden orientar hacia cualquier dirección, siempre en orden geométrico, hacia la verdad? Este núcleo que usted halla en las cantatas, y como muy bien ha expresado ahora, de pronto no puede localizarse tan bien, percibirse, por ejemplo, en algunos preludios y fugas organísticos, en muchos momentos del clave bien temperado, en ciertas sonatas y partitas para violín solo, que encierran el, el tesoro de, de la chacona, por mencionar algunos ejemplos, a veces pienso en el universo de la fantasía cromática o en el de la ofrenda musical, que es otra cosa, por supuesto, pero ¿qué observa usted en ese interior de fuerzas centrífugas, de rizomas, como los llamó Deleuze, hace ya unas décadas. Um, gosh. <laughs> I'm sure you're right. <laughs> My problem is that I'm not a very accomplished keyboard player, so I don't have the connection, the, the physical um, connection, with the well-tempered clavier, with the 48 preludes and fugues, uh, with the great organ works um, that I do with the cantatas. And I think there is a... What's that noise going on? Is it somebody with a telefonino? Anyway. Um, to me, the, f the moment that you combine music with text, with words, 
you, you are in a contra contrapuntal relationship between words and music, and it can be very fruitful. Um, if it's pure abstract music, as in the works that you mentioned, you don't have that human factor. You have the intellectual strength of a, a Spinoza, um, you have the ethical strength of, of a Spinoza or a Leibniz, um, but you don't have the sensuality or the human fallibility that you do at the moment that words and music are combined. And as you probably know, in, um, in my book, I, I try to distinguish between um, music of Bach's that colludes with the words and that then other occasions when the music collides with the, with the words. And I think that's really fascinating. And in the intersection between collusion and collision, I think you, you, you can find, or I found, that I could um, perceive the man that stands behind the music. Whereas when I listen or to and I study the, the Preludes and Fugues, I feel a slight remoteness of it. I, I, I admire it. I mean, I admire them incredibly, but I don't feel the human contact so much. But that's, that's maybe my fault. It's not the fault of Bach at all. Me ha resultado entrañable lo que usted cuenta al principio del libro cuando refiere los rudimentos interpretativos de la música antigua, aquellos tiempos de los años 60 en que se iba a ciegas y tenía tanta importancia la intuición como la imaginación, a menudo bajo un tinte, quiera ser o no, eh, romántico. Siempre anhelando saber cómo tocaban, cómo cantaban exactamente los músicos del pasado, era un fruto de la investigación, pero también de la melancolía, de la, de la añoranza de los siglos que nos precedieron. Hoy los más jóvenes no pueden imaginar cómo fueron aquellos comienzos que tenían tanto de arqueología como de sueño y de aventura. Y entonces se crearon dos bandos igualmente eh, radicales e irreconciliables, los historicistas a ultranza, y los partidarios de una línea que no podía pensar en otro Bach que no llevara la impronta del siglo XIX. Sinceramente, se lo digo muy de verdad, siempre he pensado que usted, con su trabajo, vino a poner cordura a todo esto, es decir, sentido musical. That's very kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I suppose I'm slightly allergic to the um, hagiolatry that surrounds composers. Uh, you put, you, there's been a tendency, particularly in the late 18th, all the 19th and the 20th century, to put the great composers on a pedestal. Um, and to worship them. Um, I mean, it's, it's happened with Mozart's case, it's happened with Beethoven, it's happened with Wagner, of course. I mean, God knows why, but then it has with Wagner. Um, and, and with Bach and Handel. And they all emerge like, well, marble, marble sculptures, busts, often with wigs. And they... They, they, they don't have any contact, or there's no blood or, or muscle or sinew or bones. It's just cold statuary. And that disturbs me because the music that and I love, and it, it varies hugely because I'm, you know, people might think of me as a Baroque uh, specialist, but I'm not. Um, I love all sorts of music from medieval chant to contemporary music to world music. And I, I mean, I, in my uh, teens, I worked in, uh, in Lebanon, in Beirut, and I p played my violin accompanying Feruz, the great Lebanese pop singer. Um, and uh, that was a huge experience for me. So I, I'm not just focused narrowly on, on one composer, but the music that I care for comes emanates from a human heart and a human soul. 
And it's the job of the interpreter, it's the, the, the obligation of the interpreter is to transmit to listeners, to an audience, that uh, incredible emotional force that is in music. Um, and, you know, a, a composer like Mozart uh, seems so perfect and uh, to be so spontaneous. And you think, how could it be any better than it is? And then you think, well, how did, do I reconcile what I'm hearing in Mozart with the strange man who was Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who behaved like a child. He probably had Tourette's syndrome. He, he was semi-autistic in some ways. He was extremely uh, ill-behaved. He was childish in a, in, a, in a rather appealing way, but also not always appealing way. Um, do, is there a correlation, therefore, between the human being and the personality and the greatness of the music? Well, there has to be some. But with, with Bach, it was a real problem because Bach is so remote, in a way, from uh, our experience of him as a human being because there's so few facts, there's so few letters, there's so few um, really uh, strong factual basis of his character. And therefore, you know, one is struggling to, as a, as a historian and as a musicologist, one is struggling to try and verify every conclusion you have and to, 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 to establish fact from fiction and fact from mythology. What was exciting about growing up in the 60s uh, uh, in, 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 in musical terms was suddenly there was this um, curiosity, uh, historical curiosity, but also in terms of performance practice um, of, as to how the sound world from Monteverdi to Bach changed and from Bach to Mozart and from Mozart to Beethoven and so on. And it, suddenly music emerges in the hands of these pioneers, the great pioneers. Um, I'm thinking of people like Gustav Leonhardt and, and uh, Nicholas Hanoncourt and the Koiken brothers and people whom I, I was influenced by and revered, didn't always agree with them, but I revered them, um, uh, it emerges as a much more complex tapestry of sounds, a mosaic of sounds, not all the color of this carpet. You know, it's, it's, it's multicolored and that's, that's wonderful. But the danger of that approach was that it became a little bit faddish, a little bit mannered, a little bit um, over earnest, and often a little bit like um, an autopsy, musical autopsy. Um, it was a kind of, a, uh, I don't know, it was, it was like being in a museum with no living people. And to me, the crucial thing is, is to connect with the lifeblood of music. So I've always been at a slight angle towards the period instrument movement, sometimes part of it, sometimes very critical of it. I don't know whether that's good or bad, but it, it, that's the way it has, it's been. Por eso le he dicho que, que usted vino a poner cordura. Era por eso. Usted sabe mejor que nadie que muchos quieren ver a Bach como como un músico camino de la ilustración dominado por la razón y en este sentido esgrimen la importancia que el maestro dio por ejemplo a la música especulativa y no solo eh, únicamente en los últimos años con el arte de la fuga eh, la ofrenda musical o los cánones sobre las ocho primeras notas eh, del bajo del área de las variaciones Goldberg otros sin embargo solo admiten a un Bach guiado por la espiritualidad un Bach eminentemente religioso, de hondo calado metafísico, pero en el sentido en que lo hará eh, su coetáneo Christian Wolff y poco después Kant, que entendieron la metafísica como una ciencia de Dios. O puede que en Bach se mezclen ambas cosas a la manera de Leibniz en la teogonía. Usted muy oportunamente dice que es posible que Hegel diera con una verdad cuando observó que la versión alemana de la ilustración estaba del lado de la teología.
Yeah, I think Hegel was right about that. Um, and I think, I think that this makes Bach such a, um, a, a crucial a transitional uh, figure um, between uh, Lutheranism and rational thought. Um, and he, even though I don't think he was an intellectual, and was, he certainly wasn't a, 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 um, a university trained academic, and he suffered, I think, as a result of, of being uh, mocked or at least um, downgraded by some of the intellectuals uh, in Leipzig in, in the 1730s and 40s. Uh, people like Gottsched, who was the great literary uh, figure of the time. He, because he spoke with a, a strong Thuringian accent, because he was a church musician, um, you know, he was not perceived to be um, quite of their level. And even his sons, I mean, imagine how difficult it must have been if, to be a son of Johann Sebastian Bach. I mean, Wilhelm Friedemann, his eldest son, uh, had a nervous breakdown, and you, you'd understand that if you were Bach's son, because the standards were so strong and his relentless um, pursuit of discipline. Um, but Carl Philipp Emanuel, the second son, and I think Johann Christian, um, the so-called English Bach, the one who came to England, they looked a little bit condescendingly at their father and thought, oh, he's old-fashioned. Um, you know, he's not, he hasn't the culture, he hasn't the, the broad uh, empfindsam, uh, uh, there was a German word, the, the, the sensibility um, of us, the new generation. That must have been very painful for Bach, for Johann Sebastian Bach. Very painful. And actually there's a very interesting new volume that's come out in the, in the, in the new Bach edition published by Bärenreiter. Um, it's of fugues, preludes and fugues beginnings, just the incipits, uh, and it, it's, it's Johann Sebastian Bach and his eldest son, Wilhelm Friedemann, and it's though, as though the two of them are sitting in a, in a Weinstube or a bottega with a, a gla nice glass of Rioja, or probably beer in their case, um, in Dresden, and two colleagues, father and son, but two professionals. Um, and Wilhelm Friedemann starts off with a fugue subject and then suggests the counter subject. And Johann Sebastian, the father, just leans across and says, yeah, but how about this instead? Wouldn't this work better? It gives you more possibilities. So then Wilhelm Friedemann goes back again and writes in and he says, yeah, this is all in musical notation. This is not in speech, in, in writing. This is just musical notation. It's two men, two great musicians having a, a conversation with notes, musical notes. And on it goes, and on it goes, and you can see the, the proposal and the counterproposal. And every time Bach, in a very subtle and not a condescending, not a patronizing way, comes up with the perfect solution. That must have been exasperating for the, the, the eldest son, knowing that his father just had this brain and, and mastery, superb mastery. Um, but at the same time, he's, he's occupying a position that the sons could never achieve because he is balancing spirituality with rationalism. He's balancing uh, intellectual uh, prowess and and. and and quality with an incredible joie de vivre in his music, an incredible sensuality, um, and the dance, which is so important to Johann Sebastian Bach, I think much more important in him than in his sons, is, is, is a counterbalance to the intellectualism. Uh, and again, that comes through in the cantatas, uh, and as, it, as, well, as it does in the um, Brandenburg concertos, or the orchestral suites, or the partitas you get the feeling that it's yin and yang, it's the brain on the one hand, very cerebral, and it's also the physical uh, experience of making music. And it's that balance which I find so attractive. Do, do you agree? Do you, do you feel the same? Sí, sí. Yo creo que es muy, muy acertado, sí, lo que, 
eh, lo que comenta, muchas veces he tratado de imaginar estas conversaciones ¿no? entre los hijos y, y Bach. A veces he pensado que, que él debía sentir eh, en su propia familia ¿no? cierto aislamiento y, y por supuesto, entre, entre sus propios colegas, amigos, ¿no? que eran profesionales de, de un altísimo nivel. Pero le quería comentar que ahora hace diez años eh, publiqué un libro sobre Bach, mucho más humilde que el suyo, por supuesto, una pequeña barquilla. Y si lo hice fue, y se lo digo de verdad, para cubrir, era algo muy íntimo, ¿eh? pero para cubrir una deuda que sentía con el compositor. Pues he aprendido de él tantas cosas, no solo musicales, que sentí el impulso de retornarle algo por insignificante que fuera. En la idea originaria de su libro me pregunto si hay también algo de eso, aunque si se piensa bien, en su caso la pregunta no tiene demasiado sentido porque con sus interpretaciones está devolviendo a Bach cuanto él nos ha dado, pero no quiero perder la ocasión de, de preguntárselo. Tampoco puedo desaprovechar la oportunidad de contarle que su editor, Jaume Valcorba, al que usted dirige una hermosa y, y merecida dedicatoria, estuvo escuchando, y le puedo dar fe de que fue así, durante sus últimas semanas, casi exclusivamente, sus grabaciones vaquianas, que le consolaban. La consolatio. Le doy las gracias por ello, no solo como amigo que fui del señor Valcorba, sino también como autor de Acantilado, que por fortuna, y lo hemos comentado antes, ha quedado en tan buenas manos. Pero volvamos a la pregunta. ¿Hay algo de deuda en la música en el Castillo del Cielo? Oh, you bet. Absolutely. Um, um... It's also, uh, I have to start by saying that it's also a debt to my parents because um, thanks to my parents, um, I grew up in a musical household, an amateur, not professional, but of uh, where music was part of daily life, was part of, um, uh, yeah, it was, it, I grew up on a farm. Um, my father was a farmer and he was a tree planter and he was an amateur tenor who sang on horseback and on his tractor. Um, and uh, he, he loved German music. Um, he came from, his, his mother was an Austrian, well, she was very complicated. She was Austrian, Swedish, Finnish, Hungarian, Jewish, uh, that's all. Um, and uh, he, he grew up in Berlin uh, because his father was, Uh, Sir Alan Gardiner was an Egyptologist at the um, Pergamon Museum in, in, in uh, Berlin. And my father and his sister, my aunt, they lived the first 12 years of their life in Berlin. Um, and uh, later on, uh, the father became one of the uh, discoverers of Tutankhamun's grave. Um, and he actually decoded the, uh, or helped to decode the entrance to, to Tutankhamun's um, grave and survived, unlike a lot of others who, who died. Um, so I grew up in a, in a family of, um, they were religious, my parents. My mother was uh, a Quaker, brought up a Quaker. My father was a, a Christian, a, but a, with a few pantheistic leanings. Um, he used to uh, do a lot of sun worship, sun salutations, like a yoga, yogi. Um, but in order to keep their spirits up all through the war, Uh, all the war years, um, my parents would sing with two friends in the village. They would sing the Mass for Four Voices by William Byrd, the great English composer of the contemporary of Shakespeare. And when I was growing up in this uh, house, my brother and my sister, we were always singing um, Grace Before Meals. Uh, we'd sing on a Sunday. And the first music that I learned really was music of Bach. 
and the motets. And to learn those Bach motets, which are some of the most beautiful music that he ever wrote, six motets, and to learn them as a treble um, by the age of 10 or 12, was an incredibly enriching uh, musical education. And it was then, later on, in my own case, reinforced by studying with the great Nadia Boulanger, the famous teacher who, who was a friend of Stravinsky and of Faure and, uh, and whose pupils include Lenny Bernstein and a whole lot of other great, great musicians. And I had two years study with her in Paris in the 60s, 67 and 68, during the troubled, the revolutions, quasi-revolution of May 68. And she taught me harmony and counterpoint very much in a, in a Bachian style. And I feel that I owe a huge debt to her, to my parents, and to Bach for educating me in that way. And therefore, I cannot emulate the composer Bach, because nobody can emulate Bach, the composer. But as a performer, and as, particularly as a conductor, you can repay that debt and make his music come alive. Um, I was saying earlier today uh, that the, the great privilege that we have as musicians as a, over painters or sculptors is that every time we perform this music, it, it's new, it comes alive. Whereas however wonderful a Rembrandt or a Velasquez or a, a Goya painting is, you, it doesn't change, it stays the same. It's wonderful, you look at it from a different angle, but it doesn't change. Bach's music changes all the time, and it's changed hugely. I mean, in the year 2000, um, which is the year I performed all the Bach cantatas on the appropriate Sunday and feast day throughout the year, um, we started off in the towns and where Bach himself lived um, in Germany, in Thuringia and Saxony, and then went out in ever bigger concentric circles to include Scandinavia, uh, Scotland, England, Wales, France, Italy, Spain. We came here as well. Um, and eventually we ended up in New York. And the fascinating thing to me was how Bach's music reached out to different audiences. Yes, of course, the Germans, in a way, you could say they loved it best because it's their music. But um, there was one occasion when we were in Wittenberg, which is the center of the Lutheran Reformation, and we were performing Ein Feste Burg ist unser Gott, uh, uh, you know the cantata, an 80, on Reformation Day in Luther's town. And at the end of the concert, the um, priest, the Lutheran pastor came to me and he said, Mr. Gardner, I see that next week you are in Rome. <laughs> Luther, Luther called Rome the whore of civilization. You take the good music, good work on to Rome. Well, okay, all right. Um, and then we arrived in Rome and we were giving the concert in that wonderful church, I don't know whether you know it, called Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, which is, a, it's, a, it's a church, a, a um, no, a medieval church, Gothic church, built on the foundations of a temple to Minerva. So, for example, you have a, a statue of Hercules and then a bishop lying on top of him. So it's all superimposed. And um, the audience there, not at all Lutheran, all Catholic, they were so enthusiastic about Bach's music. And I thought that would please Bach enormously. Might have pleased Luther, too. En un libro como Búsqueda sin término, Karl Popper escribió que la polifonía es la organización más inaudita, original y verdaderamente milagrosa de nuestra civilización occidental. Le parecía un absoluto milagro. Debo de confesarle que a mí también. Resulta admirable que lo diga un filósofo. Y mi pregunta la formularé a la, a, ahora a la inversa de cómo acostumbra a plantearse o a pensarse, es decir, teniendo en cuenta la capacidad de influencia de la música sobre el pensamiento, 
y no al revés. Por eso desearía saber si usted cree que la música ha influido sobre la filosofía, sobre el pensamiento de Occidente, si lo ha determinado de algún modo, si no se ha conformado, aunque quizá no lo percibamos. Hay cierta estructura musical que se puede encontrar bueno, en muchos filósofos, pero por poner unos ejemplos, Wittgenstein, Bloch, Deleuze, Kachari, mucho antes Husserl, Jankelevic, Nietzsche, por supuesto. Esta era mi, mi pregunta. Es una pregunta muy sencilla y no tengo una respuesta rápida. Quiero decir, solo... I think my initial reaction to your question is, would that, would that music had more impact on philosophy? Would that, would that people uh, could learn more from the rules of music? Um, because m music, particularly Bachian music, is such an incredible um, paradigm of how to live a good life. Um, It, it, it has to be conversational to work. Um, and so it's a good model for social intercourse. I mean, if, you are, if you're performing even a Bach chorale with four voices, there is a, a give and a take. It's no good saying, I'm the melody, I'm going to sing loud, and everybody else can sing softly to accompany me. Or the bass line saying, I'm the fundament of this music. I'm the, the basis of it. Therefore, everybody else should shut up. It's, it's, it's a conversation where four equal voices interlock and intersect and interweave. And, and it's like, a, in a way, it's like a, a dance as well, because sometimes you need to retreat and sometimes you need to advance, depending on the relative importance of any phrase. Um, I mean, that's just a very simple example, but I mean, Uh, the idea that the human brain is capable of such complex thought, but um, articulated in such an in incredibly elegant way, which comes from rhetoric. It it's comes from ancient Greek and Roman rhetoric, um, and the uh, Quintilian, obviously, Cicero as well, Uh, that you, you come up with a proposition, a philosophical proposition, and then you have a counter-proposition. Um, and there is something incredibly educative uh, to learn from that. Um, I do think that, that, that Bach has had a very positive impact on the way people, not just musicians, but the way philosophers and the way thinkers um, develop their thoughts. I mean, you, I'm sure you will know that there's this, this exchange of letters between Zelte and Goethe at the end of the 18th century, um, when Zelte, who is conducting some of the Bach cantatas and passions and motets, says to Goethe, you must go and listen to this music. And Goethe hears it and is completely overwhelmed. Um, and then all through the 19th century, I can't think of any composer of merit who has not been hugely influenced one way or another by Bach. I mean, Mendelssohn most famously because he revived the Matthew Passion, but also Robert Schumann, Brahms above all, um, who looked forward to the publication of Bach's works as though it was a new present coming through the letterbox every time a new volume arrived. Um, and I find that really touching. And also that um, Robert Schumann, every time he had mental problems, which was quite frequently, he found his way back to sanity was by playing Bach Preludes and Fugues. And, you know, uh, uh, Pablo Casals, famous cellist, used to play a prelude and fugue every single day. It was like cleaning, brushing his teeth. For him, it was hygiene. It was a kind of type of hygiene. And I, to me, Bach is, is a type of musical hygiene. Um, then things go terribly wrong, don't they, in the 19th century? I mean, there's this great figure called Richard Wagner, who is about as 
anti-Bach in every way as you could imagine, and who, who is close maybe to Nietzsche in terms of or Schopenhauer in terms of his philosophy, but it's a very different philosophy from that of the enlightened figures. I mean, you mentioned Spinoza, who is a great hero of mine, Isaac Newton, uh, Leibniz, uh, who are all, and, and the early um, French philosophers uh, as well. I mean, particularly uh, Voltaire and um, Montesquieu. Um, does Bach have any impact on philosophy today? I doubt it, and more's a pity. And wouldn't it be fantastic if our politicians, instead of arguing with each other, started each meeting by singing a Bach chorale? How would that be? Wouldn't that be fantastic? No sé si me oirá porque esto no funciona. ¿Me oye? ¿Me oye bien? I can hear you. ¿Sí? No se asuste. ¿eh? San Agustín escribió en el tratado sobre música que los números discurren en medio de un insondable espacio en armoniosa sucesión y lo que llamó números sonoros forman el todo, la unidad. En la divinidad hay número, decía. ¿Qué peso tuvo esta concepción en Bach, el número? Después, lo que se ha dado en llamar la numerología secreta. ¿Fue tan determinante en él como pretenden algunos libros que analizan las partituras de Bach y las estudian como si se tratara de un laberinto numérico? Y otra cosa que desearía saber, señor Gardiner, si fue tan significativo en él la presencia de la simbología, más allá de ejemplos muy evidentes como el caso del preludio y fuga en mi bemol mayor, BWV 552, con tres bemoles en la armadura, tres secciones y tres grupos temáticos. A veces pienso que ciertos estudiosos tratan de buscar lo que Bach no pretendió. Unos autores franceses han querido presentarlo hace muy poco como un alquimista. ¿Qué, qué piensa usted de, de todo esto? I think you're, we are all in danger of going back to the old um, mythology and of putting Bach on a pedestal and say, saying he is the supreme thinker. He is the alchemist. He is the supreme mathematician. It could be so, and uh, I personally think that Bach was un, un, no, not unnaturally, was exceptionally um, perceptive as an intuitive mathematician. In other words, he he didn't have to count out the number of bars in order to create exactly B-A-C-H, his initials, in, which come up to 14 or 42 if you put in Johann Sebastian Bach. He didn't need to do that. It was an intuitive thinking on his part. And I think he had an, an exceptionally developed sense of proportion and of ratio It doesn't mean that he followed the golden mean exactly in, in all his compositions. And there's certainly one or two numerologists now around who are trying to say everything can be reduced to numerological proportion. I think, honestly, that's exaggerated uh, and not even terribly interesting. I mean, what is interesting is how we respond to the music. And if, if, if there is something intrinsically proportionate about his music that we assent to, not, not as in a computing, calculating way, but just because of the, the, the presence of the rhythms and the satisfying proportions and rhythms, that is something to be grateful for and to uh, applaud him for, rather than to turn him into a demigod uh, and to, 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 to worship at, at, at the, at the on your knees. Yes, of course he's admirable. Yes, of course he is influenced by the early Christian fathers, including St. Augustine. Um, 
But he is a man like you and me as well. He is a man who, who, who is of flesh and blood and who was a father of 23 children and who enjoyed the good things of life and who, who managed in, in such an exceptional way to balance the cerebral and the physical and the, the mathematical and the purely um, instinctive and intuitive. And to me, that makes him a much more interesting figure than if he is just a perfectionist. Yes, you can admire the perfection, but the perfection then becomes something a little cold. Whereas if you understand me, you referred earlier to the solace and the comfort that he can bring to people who are going through a grieving process. And it's absolutely extraordinary that. And I've got so many examples of that in my own uh, friendships with people uh, who have been, who are maybe atheists or agnostics or not even particularly musically inclined, who listen to a Bach cantata or a motet and immediately feel um, a warmth and a, and, a, and a spiritual glow which is inexplicable. Um, there's a series of cantatas that Bach wrote on the, for the 16th Sunday after Trinity, um, which are all to do with, um, they're all to do with the death of very young children in, in, in childbirth. And of Bach's children, I think it was 10 who died before the age of two and a half or three. So death was ever present in his life, in his, in his own life. And Bach's music is never morbid, was never um, saccharine or sugary in a, in a, in a, in a sort of uh, morbid way. It's, it has a, a, a positivity and a, an uplift and a, and a regenerative capacity, which I find just overwhelming. It's, it's, it's so beautiful. Um, and it, 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 I would counsel anybody who, who, who really has a problem with, with grieving or bereavement or even doubts about their own psychological state of mind, just to, to enjoy listening to, to Bach. Be, be very selective, but you know, it could be the cello suites, it could be the violin partitas, it could be the the great Chacon, or it could be the cantatas he wrote for the 16th Sunday after Trinity, which I'm particularly fond of. It could be, uh, oh yeah, I'll tell you one, which is absolutely crazy, a piece, Cantata 20, um, O Ewigkeit du Donnerwort, O Eternity, Thou Word of Thunder. I mean, it starts off really terrifying, uh, uh, as though, you know, Armageddon is here, or uh, as if the last judgment is going to be imminent. And it, it goes through a series of uh, very harsh lessons about you must pay attention, you have to put your house in order because you never know when you're going to die. And watch out because um, you might be um, hearing the, the, the hearse, the, 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 the uh, um, do you know what a hearse is? Uh, uh, she may not get the hearse. A hearse is a cart that carries the coffin. Yeah? yeah? OK. You may hear it coming across the cobbled streets and then somebody knocking on your door. And, the, and this, if you're not ready, you're stuffed. You're, you're in a bad state of mind. Um, so everything seems negative and terrifying. And then he transforms the thing and just saying, it's, like a, it's almost like a sort of little child. And he would say, it's all right. You'll be okay in the end. It, 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 there's a wonderful feeling of um, comfort and uh, assurance, reassurance. That's such a unique thing in a, com in a composer. I, it's one of the th attributes of Bach that I, I value and attribute uh, great greatness to. Yo, pre yo, yo precisamente tenía una pregunta sobre, sobre el consuelo, ya que antes hemos hablado de consuelo, de quienes lo buscamos, a veces muy a menudo, 
sentimos una gratitud impagable con Bach, efectivamente. Quizá él a su vez buscó ese consuelo en la música porque estuvo, como muy bien ha dicho en otras ocasiones, eh, rodeado de muerte, eh, como le sucedió, y así lo refiere en su libro a Mark Twain, recuerdo que, que lo menciona, no solo la muerte de personas cercanas, sino la crudeza de, de un tiempo, un tiempo que le precedió, eh, atenazado por la enfermedad, por la guerra, eh, pura indefensión. Mm, me ha gustado mucho que, que usted incorpora un soneto de Griffius, que es un poco el equivalente literario de, de un pintor español, de Valdés Leal, eh, donde se ve la, la propia descomposición humana del espíritu, del cuerpo. Pero usted dice textualmente en, en su hermoso libro que nadie más que Bach ha compuesto música consoladora y lo asombroso es que, que pronto, muy pronto, adquirió ese don ya a la edad de 22 años al escribir Actos Tragicus. La música, quizá más que ningún otro arte, tiene esa capacidad de, de consolar. Tenemos ejemplos de esa virtud consolatoria incluso en la literatura egipcia, en ¿eh? los cantos de los arpistas egipcios en la Ilíada, también en Virgilio, y entre paréntesis le digo que usted como buen granjero le gustarán las geórgicas. En la música occidental hay ciertos compositores... Janine, Janine, say that again. En la música occidental hay ciertos compositores que tienen un don especial para, la para el consuelo. Y estoy pensando en Parcel, en Mozart, en Schubert. ¿Qué puede decirnos sobre esto? Janine, you lost me there. You, there's one word there back there. I just had no clue what you were talking about. You were really losing your grip, you know. She's not. She's doing great. I have to tease her a little bit. Um, I'm sure you all know that Bach lost both his parents uh, by the time he was 10. So he was doubly an orphan. And that was the pivotal moment of his life because um, being a Bach means that you were in, brought up in a musical family and music was like breathing oxygen. It meant that he was not a very good pupil at school because he was always working or around his father and family um, and his, his cousin who was a wonderful organist, Johann Christoph Bach in, in Eisenach. Then suddenly the death of both parents And he has to go and live with his elder brother, Johann Christoph, who's uh, 12 years, 14 years older than him. He hardly knew his elder brother. And he, he's living in a household where there's uh, not much room. And I'm not sure how welcome he was. Not sure. But what does Bach do? He puts all his grieving, all his bereavement into learning, learning both academically. Suddenly his school grades shoot up. They've been rather poor in Eisenach and in Ordruf, living with his brother, they, he goes to the top of the class very quickly. Then he starts learning music at a prodigious rate. Uh, and there's a famous anecdote, which I'm sure you all know, about him stealing uh, the piece of music or pieces of music which are locked away in a cupboard and copying them out at night. Whether it's true or false, who knows, but it's, it's, it, it's characteristic of somebody who has a hunger for learning and a hunger for copying examples and self-improvement. Um, so uh, th it's probably got more than a grain of truth. And then, as you rightly say, um, he composes, when he starts to compose, uh, probably already in his teens, he comes up at the age of 22 with two unbelievable pieces of, of, of cantatas. One of them is num cantata number four, Chris Lag in Todesbanden, and the other is the Actus Tragicus, which is just unbelievable. And one of the things that happens, I'm sure you know, in the Actus Tragicus is that he describes in music the passing of the Christian soul. 
that, that the Christian soul is, is on its way out of the human body and is traveling to heaven. And you, you, it, just like an arabesque, you feel that the, the soul is fluttering and it's gone. And there's a silence at the end of it, which is, you know, you have to grip your chair because it's so poignant, the silence. It's unbelievable. Now that can only, to me, have come from not just a, a great musical mind, but a soul who, as somebody who, who has experienced death of very close proximity and has come to terms with death in a, in a, quite a way. And you have to remember that Bach was the second generation of Germans who'd come through the Thirty Years' War, the Thirty Years' War which was on the same scale of de devastation as the First World War was in Europe, or as the, the dreadful you know, peninsula, the, 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 the wars that Goya um, described so incredibly in his paintings, um, the Napoleonic Wars here in Spain, in terms of the gruesomeness of warfare and of death. Um, and Bach seemed to have had this unique ability to, to somehow encapsulate something which was horrendous. And, uh, and you mentioned Griffius. I could also mention Cranach or Grunewald, Grunewald particularly, you know, the Eisenheim altarpiece, where nothing is left to the imagination um, in a sense that the physical decay is part of, of Christ uh, suffering and brought down after the, the crucifixion is, is painted in the most gruesome way. And Bach can do that as well, but he also mitigates it with um, this sense that there is the possibility of a different life. Um, and one of the illustrations in, in, in the book, which I'm very fond of, is of the earthly concert and the heavenly concert. That on earth, you see musicians gathered around an organ and they're playing music and let's hope it's in tune, let's hope it's together, let's hope it's, it's, it's performed with devotion and sincerity. And then above the same, in the same uh, picture, you see the heavenly music, and there in miniature you see the organ and the same musicians, and there in Bach's mind everything is perfect. Uh, you know, there, there are no awkward characters. The angels make the music perfect. It may seem very naive, and of course it is naive in a way, but you only have to listen to Bach's music for Christmas, uh, and I'm not talking just of the Christmas oratory, I'm talking of the great cantatas. And any time that he uses trumpets and drums, and you get a, a foretaste, uh, an anticipation of what music can be in the ideal world. And that again, I find incredibly touching and comforting, even if I don't believe literally in, in an afterlife. I think the concept of, of angelic forces is something that we can all of us get our minds around. We can, we can, we can postulate um, a perfection, a sort of superhuman perfection of music making. And one of the great uh, uh, spurs, or uh, um, the things that spurs me on as a conductor is the idea that Bach himself had terrible disappointments as a as a musician, as a conductor, and, uh, because his musical forces were very often insufficient and inadequate to realize the music as he heard it in his inner ear. I mean, we know that he would intervene in a performance. He would jump up and he would, if a keyboard player wasn't doing the right thing, he, Bach's hands would come over around him and start playing the things, or he'd seize the violin and, and start playing it better, or he would sing a, a, a part. He was, he was always involved in performance, and I think he was incredibly frustrated by that. And what's wonderful is that, you know, all these years after his death, we have more time and more, yeah, more time and maybe even more 
professional expertise in a good orchestra, in a good choir, to do justice to his music or to attempt to do justice to his music. And so if I'm conducting the, the B minor mass or, or the St. Matthew Passion, as, as I'm going to be doing here next in the Palau de la Musica next year, um, I can't say, oh, well, I can do it better than Bach. Of course I can't. That would be preposterous and ridiculously arrogant. But I think I have better conditions of work uh, than he did, and therefore I can do my bit to repay the debt that you referred to. Se nos está terminando el tiempo. Tenía un montón de de preguntas, preguntarle sobre su amplísimo repertorio. Como usted ha dicho, no es eh, solamente un, un director del de, de repertorio barroco. Eh, muchos se sorprendieron cuando grabó La Viuda Alegre, por ejemplo. Pero tengo una pregunta. Que... <risa> sí. Pero tengo una pregunta quizá que sea la, la última que, que pueda hacerle lamentablemente, pero es la siguiente. Anton Weber, en el camino hacia la nueva música, dijo que todo acontecía en Bach y que lo que vino después ya había sido preparado por él. Me pregunto, ¿qué piensa usted de la música compuesta a partir de 1950, sobre todo la surgida a raíz de la escuela de Darmstadt, con maestros como Stockhausen, Nono, Berio. Ligeti se desvinculó pronto de, de esta corriente. Ha habido compositores como, como Morton Feldman o el mencionado Ligeti que han tenido una incidencia muy directa en el lenguaje musical de hoy, en el sonido que puede identificarse en los cuadros de Gerhard Richter, por ejemplo, o en las esculturas de, de Richard Serra, o en algún lienzo de Rodko. ¿Qué, qué opinión le merece eh, esta música? Cali, you said we don't have any time. And I... <laughs> well, in no particular order, the Merry Widow of Leha is the most charming and wonderful piece, not very influenced by Bach. But I can tell you, um, performing and conducting that with the Vienna Philharmonic um, about 15 years ago was a huge pleasure. And it also, with the fee that I got from conducting that, I was able to, to build a, um, a barn for my cows in, in Dorset. <laughs> It says Merry, Merry Widow um, on the outside. So, um, my attitude towards contemporary music since 1950 is, um, is inevitably um, influenced by being a pupil of Nadia Boulanger, who had the most amazingly Catholic open tastes and who, who, who influenced um, composers such as Elliot Carter, Aaron Copland, uh, uh, Roger Sessions, uh, a lot of English composers as well, B British composers, um, and who had a very discriminating um, way of assessing the validity and the, 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 the worth, the underlying worth of a piece of composition. So I, I, I tend to s approach contemporary music very much with her, her warnings and her um, uh, alarm system in, in my ear. Uh, and some of the music I find so strange and so uh, cerebral that I can't relate to it. And some, I mean, you, and thank God you mentioned Ligeti because Ligeti I think is really, really uh, interesting. And, Another Hungarian composer who I think is fascinating is um, Georgi Kurtag, who, who is a terrifyingly clever musician um, and composer. And he actually 
um, he, he gave me the first performance of um, one of his works uh, called, it has the very jolly title of Songs of Death and Despair, and they're settings of poems by Yevtushenko. And it's written for an a cappella choir of 23 vo voices with microtones and God knows what. And it's incredibly complex. And uh, the composer came to my rehearsals uh, and he expected a performance from the first rehearsal. And my choir was struggling because of the microtones and the fact that it was written in Cyrillic as well. Um, and the barring was so complex. And I could see Gyogi was getting really quite irritated. And I thought, what can I do about this? Um, and it got to the evening before the performance. We were in Amsterdam at the, in doing it in the Concertgebouw. And thank God I met Pierre Boulez in the corridor. And I said, Pierre, are you free tomorrow? Could you, could you conduct this piece? Because I, I really can't do it. And he said, no, my dear, I, 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 cannot, I cannot conduct it. I am not free. He said, what you have to do, you have to Rebar, rebar it, rebar it, put different bar lines in. And I said, I can't do that because he's there. He said, don't worry, my dear, I come, I take him for a coffee. <laughs> and he did. Pierre came the next day and he took Georgi Kurtak out for coffee. And in that time, I had 10 minutes and I managed to rebar it and get it all, and it worked. It sort of all aligned suddenly, whoa. And the performance was just about okay, but the composer, I couldn't fool him. He said, I know what you did. You rebarred it, didn't you? <laughs> anyway. Thank you.